It's February 4th, 2021. This is Rook. One of the sad realities of Iran and Iranians post-revolution is that people of great talent and potential have to leave the homeland to flourish or become the best at what they do. This is particularly true of musical artists and creators in a land where entire genres of music have been banned. So it's all the more impressive when someone can become a world-class jazz and pop musician without ever leaving Iran. Reza Tajbakhsh is one of the busiest composers, arrangers, multi-instrumentalists, performers, and producers in Iran. He joins me from Tehran for his first ever English interview today. This is Conversations From, To and About the Iranian Diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 82 of Rook. Number Hashtodo Kian. That's that's 82. Yes, thank you, Jean, for that very <laughs> valuable lesson. Hope you're keeping well, wherever you are, tuning in from around the world. Salam Dustana Aziz. Khoshamari Sad Salbin Salha. Huh? I'm getting ready for eight. Sounds like Arusi. Sounds like an Arusi. <laughs> It's always an Arusi with me here on this show. I'm wedded to the program, Kian. Listen, we are on an ongoing mission, Kian Docht, to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, your choice may be Spotify or iTunes, Castbox, Telegram, Telegram, Chodemun, as Iran wanted to get Telegram, and Instagram, Inst. Inst- Instagram? In no. Instagram. In Instagram. Uh, YouTube, I don't know if I mentioned that. Should I go through them again? <laughs> <laughs> One more time for the cheap seats. <laughs> Captain Reza, how are you? Very well, sir. How are you? Uh, has your girlfriend been make, making you Lubia Polo? That actually, yes, she did. She All made right. a big tub of Lubia Polo the other day, so I brought it to work for three well, days. That explains in a row. why you're expanding <laughs> at such a, <laughs> such a rate. Uh, but still, Hosh Tip, still the best looking man oh, in. Uh, in the booth like, uh, <laughs> not including Shia no. who is also very good looking no, I, there was no way I could get out of that no. <laughs> I was in deep uh, Groovy Shia hello hello Zamai. we have Chef Haas coming up with a new edition of Hospitality excited about that uh, my sources tell me <laughs> that it's going to be something to do with Bagali Polo Ooh. the Iranians in the audience will not yet see now we're mm. now we're hungry yeah. uh and uh, so Chef Haas coming up, uh, Reza Taj Bakhsh yes. coming up from Tehran. I mentioned this in the, the intro there a few seconds ago that I think this is his first ever interview in English. Uh, I'm so honored. I really, I really appreciate what this guy does. He is, first of all, a killer player. I yes. mean, he is... Uh, a, a master on piano. He's a great, the bass, the drums, he, he arranges, he composes. Uh, he's involved in so much of uh, contemporary pop music and, and jazz and stuff coming out of Iran. Um, relatively young guy, although he looks like 15, even though he's like, <laughs> I think he's in his late 30s or 40 or something like that. Uh, but very much looking forward to talking to him, hearing his story, uh, why he is elected to stay in Iran, mm-hmm. as opposed to so many other musicians who get out of there, you know. Uh, and um, uh, Shia, I know you you, yes, you know him as a great a, musician. He's a here. great pianist, and <laughs> honestly, I always... Uh, would like to be able to play like him, but mm. uh, he sadly really you will never play like <laughs> him. Yeah, no, really, no. He is a, he no, no. Is. You're, no. You're amazing too. He's yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's going to be. Uh, have you ever heard of this guy, Keon? I've never heard of him. Uh, no. Well, just wait. Just I, you I wait. Can't, I can't wait, young Keon. <laughs> you can't wait. We have to wait because well, we're about yes, to do it. Yes, but I mean, I just can't wait. Oh, you see, so can't exciting. Wait. Right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's trying to get down. Abbott and Costello. <laughs> Let me explain who they are to you later on. Uh, um, <laughs> listen, I have an important announcement. Bachaw, are you ready? Yes. 
Drum roll. Suspense is killing me. Actually, the important announcement is for the audience, not to you guys, because you already know about it. <laughs> we need your help, That's dear right. audience. We need your help out there. If you are a regular listener of Rook or mm. The Rook, as some people incorrectly know us, <laughs> <laughs> if you like what we're doing, if you appreciate this program and our mission here, we need your help to keep this thing going. So, you know, we've been doing this for nine and a half months, mm-hmm. and we've been uh, finding ways to make it work. No one is in this to, to get rich, of course. This is our about our passion for our culture and our community and uh, addressing issues and questions and concerns and, and also um, exploring and celebrating uh, a, a lot of people from throughout the world of Iranian descent. But it does require resources to be able to do this. And we've been talking about this as a team and saying we don't want this show to just become a series of ads, yeah, that's of right. commercials, you know? Oh, um, Lord. Nobody wants Sponsor that. names. I mean, we don't want the show, the show to turn into the equivalent of one of those Persian magazines that <laughs> the, the front page is all just real estate yeah. ads, like little yeah. boxes with the, and oh. then I'd be like on the oh. show reading, oh. uh, we want to thank Nazi Khushbacht. <laughs> Mohammed Reza, Sahar from Richmond Hill, uh, Abbas from Escarborough, uh, maybe not the Geki, you know, like Mortgage it's broker, Mohammed. The entire show. Uh, That'll yeah. be the no. entire show. <laughs> <laughs> Allow me to just pull out my gun and shoot myself. So what we've done is we've created a patrons page. So this is a, a page where you guys can effectively be part of our team, be pa- patrons of, of Rook. You can support yes. us, r- support the program become a patron for a few dollars a month now for this you get there's little different packages yeah. there's different packages captain reza i know uh, i know i became a patron myself you I did yeah, me too I, yeah five bucks i, I mean <laughs> five bucks well that's yeah, well, that's, that's, that's all fine, i can afford that's fine. we'll take it we'll take it, take it. You're, you're a starving uh, artist filmmaker uh so we <laughs> you're clearly not starving by the, <laughs> the, the amount of lubia me. polo the guy is consuming <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Should we have, like, up that to ten bucks a month? All right, <laughs> sell some of that Lubia Polo, right, please. Fine, we, ten bucks. Y- y- you get extra content and merchandise, special access depending on your level as a as a patron. Uh, you can be our patron. Uh, we call you a friend with a capital F, a friend for yes. five bucks a month. Ten dollars a month, you can be a BFF. Twenty five dollars a month, you can be our idol. Mm-hmm. Fifty bucks a month, a rock star. Now you're really getting into the territory where you can really help us out. So uh, I know, uh, are there any wealthy people in the Iranian community? <laughs> are there ever? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. Are there any people who have some spare change? Uh, $250 a month, you become a legend. Uh, all you have to do is go to uh, rookmedia.com. Really, five bucks a month. Even that, just it really helps us out. It avoids us mm. having to put a bunch of ads and sponsors. We, we will always love to have some sponsors for this program, but we don't want it to become, yeah. to dominate the content of the yeah show so rookmedia.com is our website rookmedia.com just click on the support us button yeah. uh, we really appreciate it we are we we see every name that comes in and becomes a patron and it means the world to us um, you know dear Persian friends think about how much money you spend on hairspray before one mehmuni and I'm talking to the men uh, the, the, talking to the men out there uh, allow me to calculate <laughs> not even that's you're, you're not too far oh, off actually that's that's right. so you know uh, I told my mom about this patrons thing mm-hmm. and uh she, it didn't go well. She was uh, she oh, was she why. was mortified. Like she was uh because I you know you know Persians and my, my, my mom was first of all my mom's always worried what people are going to think and you know and now some of her friends are listening to Rook and stuff and so so she said uh, you know you know she speaks like yeah. Shia you know. <laughs> she's <laughs> they sound remarkably similar the, my impressions of Shia uh, you are, you are going to ask people for money and I was like um well, yeah, mom. It's what you know what what people do these days. And she, you know, she sat down like she she needed some water. Like it was like a you know. Oh no, you you don't understand. You know, uh, I, so my mom like offered to sell the house. You know, like I will. I, what can I do to prevent this tragedy of you going and asking for money? 
Because, you know, I guess it. Uh, uh, this is a, not something that's, you know, in the Persian community, we always have to act like... Yeah, you know, money. Yeah. yeah to get, but right. it's very Taboo. common amongst, like, other podcasters or content creators out there that they set up, like, a patrons page or mm -hmm. they do crowdfunding. It is the way to do it it's these the days. It. It's yeah. basically yeah. a form of subscription. 100%. And especially if you don't want to descend into the complete advertising thing, it is the way to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and again, of course, you know, we like to have sponsors as well but if we can turn this into a crowdsourced thing yep. yes. it's it it works for us and, as a team and that's the thing we want to be selective with our sponsors we don't just take on anybody so uh, and in order to create a show for the community we want it to be supported by the community so that's right. go to the website rookmedia.com and become a patron that said if the uh, gasoline company Exxon would like to <laughs> invest we are with open we with open arms we think <laughs> they're one of those companies that we very much respect <laughs> In terms we will of sell our agenda. souls. <laughs> I shouldn't joke. Is Exxon owned by a Persian? I should be careful. Uh, let's dig you it. You know, my dad. I, this reminds me of when I when I was a uh, um, when I was playing in the band in the 1990s. We we were theater students, and mm -hmm. we started as uh, theater students in high school. Who we went out on the streets, and we started to um, do what we called guerrilla theater, which is um, performing street performing. You know, and then we would sing and we would play instruments, and that turned. It, we became a band basically. Mm -hmm. But but our first iteration was these street performing which of course in the West is called busking you know we were buskers and there are buskers festivals and it, 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 there's a rich tradition of artistic like vaudevillian kind of performance that is called busking mm -hmm. and it's like uh, jugglers and and uh, comedians and and mimes and musicians and you know, and uh, man, the first time I told my dad, you know, I was like, uh, "No, dad, it's a uh, we're we're buskers. We are doing, yes, we have a name for this in Iran as well. <laughs> it is called begging. Yeah, yeah." No, I was like, no, Dad, but this is what artists do. You know, it was a disaster. Like for years, oh, my boy. parents avoided saying what I do. You know, they were like, uh, they were like, who is Tassi Kade? Like they would avoid just like saying I'm in a band. Yeah. They probably thought you, know. you were wearing eye patch and holding. And then the Pezesh, the family Pezesh, was like, uh, asked for tickets to one of the shows, and suddenly it just started to change oh, a little bit. They were like, oh, okay, I hope you know. He is, but really, until I was on TV and stuff, they, and even then, it was like, it was, you know, m mortified that I wasn't an engineer. You know? <laughs> I'm a busker. Like, what does that mean? In a, anyway, this is like that. It's like we're, we are mm -hmm. your street performers. Yeah. We ask you to be our patrons. Rookmedia.com. Think of it as supporting your friends here at Rook and, and this enterprise that we're trying to grow in English for the global community. And, uh, there you go. Actually, this is really like a street platform in in the in the COVID area. You know, mm. all the platforms is like a. <laughs> it's true. <street laughs> it's used, true. Um, it's like one big mall. Yeah, you know yeah. that, and yeah. we're standing outside of it. Um, listen, if you do go to Rook Media. Uh, dot com to check out this support page see what the different pa Wait, there's merchandise there too by the way yes there is say say uh say someone's dating a doctor kian i, I haven't the clue <laughs> yeah. who who would be and doing the doctor a thing. wants a nice hoodie ah. Ah. he in i mean this hypothetical doctor <laughs> hypothetical yeah of course. he could become a patron at, at, at rook and then he would get a hoodie and buy a gift a birthday gift for the girlfriend oh. i suppose for the lovely oh. and that, that, that shall be the end of the relationship <laughs> <laughs> right there and wow and see wow. <laughs> wow. if you do go to rookmedia.com you will also see our latest video uh, from Chef Haas, and there'll be a, a new one up today as soon as uh, we get through his segment. Uh, he describes how his latest recipe and how to make um, various versions of Persian food, his kitchen secrets, rookmedia.com. Reza Tajbaksh is coming up. But first, it's Thursday, and you know what that means. She's a dear friend, a diaspora blend, a gym fanatic, a kook who could be erratic, but lovable, smart, and f funny, and and Hermes, <laughs> and, and, and on a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Batjaha. It's all Persian to us with Kian Nademi. Uh, yeah. I'm going to let that Mugermes comment slide <laughs> just for now. Mm -hmm. So once upon a time, long, long ago in BC, and by that I mean before COVID, us <laughs> ladies would get dressed up. 
We put on our finest attire, do our hair and makeup, and go out on the town to practice the ancient art known as socializing. But of course, no outfit was complete without an exquisite pair of... Anybody? Pair of... Mm. Earrings? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what are we supposed to say? Uh, okay, it makes your legs longer and it oh. just it makes heels. It, yes, oh. a pair stretching of, machines. <laughs> <laughs> pair of high heels, Reza. Heels. Ten, ten heels. points for you. Ooh, we can get thanks. you to college one day. <laughs> yes, high heels, stilettos, pumps, strappy sandals, open toes, closed toes, whatever toes, you name it. Mm. Us ladies love our high heels. And guess who we have to thank for this wondrous invention? Oh, Iranians. The Persians. Oh. Get out. To be more yeah. specific, heels. we invented heels. Mm -hmm. To be more specific, Persian men. Oh, uh huh. Oh, yes, wow. ladies, you heard me. Persian men were the first species ever known to elongate their legs with an oh so. Oh, we wore the high heels. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I thought we just invented them to give <laughs> so them. I was to building up to. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, wow. Persian men. Very Bowie. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Very David Bowie. Yeah. Yeah. Persian men were the first species ever known to elongate their legs with an oh so sexy pair of heels. But their purpose wasn't to look sexy. No, no, not these macho men. They wore them for a functional purpose instead. The first high heels ever served as a piece of military footwear in the 10th century Persia. Wow. Oh. Isn't that shocking? Clearly not the, <laughs> not the Louboutins. That would be hard to engage in war with. Uh, that is true. But no, what kind of high heels were these, Keon? Well, allow me to elaborate. Oh. Uh, that's what I was getting I to, I figured Gian. the fact that you I'm were looking you down asked. at your computer suggested you had more, yeah. I'm glad you asked, Gian. Uh, Persians were known as a highly skilled horse riders, and that's actually how they fought in battle. They rode in saddles and stood up on their stirrups to shoot their enemies with arrows. Mm. This, of course, meant they needed a way to secure and stabilize their feet as they were doing this. Well, what better way to do so than with a sexy pair of heels? Really? Naturally. Yeah. That would secure the feet? I thought, why, why not like Birkenstocks? Or, something? <laughs> well, I mean, or like, like army <laughs> boots? <laughs> why, would, why are well, high heels oh, going to secure I'm, the I'm, feet? I'm exaggerating. Oh, so see. they were yeah. like, you know, heeled boots, but ah, basically like, like, like a platform. Like glam rock boots. Yeah, not <laughs> stilettos by <laughs> any <laughs> means. Yeah. Okay. Gian was thinking about Kate Spade. Yeah. On the heels. <laughs> right, right, right. Not Louboutins. Okay. Not the Louboutins. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, by the 16th century, the Shah of Persia, Abbas I, had the largest cavalry in the world. He was a man known for his impressive military and diplomacy skills. Yet he was faced with his greatest enemy, the Ottoman Empire. Mm. To help him defeat his enemy, he needed to gain an alliance with European nations. So he sent a group of emissaries into Europe to create new partnerships. They walked into the European courts looking ever so sexy in their finest high heels. Ooh, what divine shoes they have on, the Europeans proclaimed with fascination at this intriguing new style. A wave of interest in all things Persian spread throughout European courts, especially this fancy new footwear. So wait a second. The Europeans weren't wearing heels. No, they no. weren't. It was like a those new old thing. the guys with the white wigs and stuff. They didn't have well, heels. Well, that's that's they eventually we taught did. them that. Yes, we oh, taught them oh, that. Okay. That's exactly that the point. So just like that, this new Persian style swept throughout Europe like wildfire. It became the hottest new fashion item amongst aristocratic men in Europe, who started wearing high heels to emulate the strength of the Persians. There you go. Watch out, ladies. Mm -hmm. Even <laughs> <laughs> even even Elizabeth the first started wearing wearing them to appear more manly. Oh. I heard that, sister. You know, uh, that, that's the funny part that you would think that it was the women that started to wear them, but it was actually, it was actually the men. Cl clearly not, yeah. <laughs> so male aristocrats wore them to appear taller and more formidable. Mm. How else do you think Louis XIV, all five foot four inches of him, was able to rule France? Oh. Speaking of little man Louis, the poster child for men's high heels, he famously met, made the red heel synonymous with the status of prestige. He went as far as declaring it a law that only nobility could wear red heels, and also that no one could have heels higher than his highest pair. Are we which, still talking about Persians now? <laughs> <laughs> the history of Louis the Fourteenth. I am get, getting to how <laughs> heels. So, 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 the entire it's turned into a survey course on French history. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it started with the Persians. Revolution. Yes, I see. I'm, Are I'm, you going to be working through every century of heels <laughs> through yeah, other cultures I'm, now? I'm, there's going right. to be a nice little okay. way that I'm going to end Thank it you. off. Right, yeah. Right, yes. So, so his highest peers were. A heel. His highest pair was five inches tall, so he made it a law that only 
only like they had to everybody else could wear lower heels <laughs> and oh, so, only he wore that yes wow. only he was allowed to wear the That's high heels I'm just the point is Ooh, that it guy. became a status of like you know being manly and sure. strong yes, and strength course, yeah. yes so this is actually where today's famous Louboutin red soles came from it came from this oh. whole thing funny enough after the French Revolution in 1791 Another little man by the name of Napoleon later banished high heels in an effort to create more equality. Hmm. He associated them Another with... Another famous Iranian. <laughs> uh, Where is this going? Well, well, let me Are get you, to we it. already know. We, we invented the high heels. Yes, Now yes. we're in... But right. the point is yes. that, it, that it became this huge thing yes, up until clearly. modern times. People so. have been wearing heels. Yes, we yes, know. Yeah, yes. Yeah. But of course, this later came back into fashion. This time, however, it was the women that started wearing them. Oh. So you see, high heels weren't invented with the intention of elongating women's legs to appear more sexy, as one would assume. It only accidentally turned out that way. This Persian invention served as a functional and practical use, but it quickly turned into a very impractical, uncomfortable, yet very fashionable way for ladies to stand out. As the sex symbol herself, Miss Marilyn Monroe famously once said, I don't know who invented high heels, but all women owe him a lot. Well, ladies, we have Persian men to thank for that. It's all Persian to us. Oh. Isn't yes. that quite shocking? Well, uh, <laughs> somehow it makes sense, I feel. I'm you not going to lie to you. I don't know, but I've been wondering why Shia has been looking so uncomfortable through this whole story. <laughs> Could it thought, be the heels he's wearing? <laughs> no, what, 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 Shia, did you know this? Or you, why do you, you no, have a no. puzzled look on your face? I, I, I knew that men wore uh, high heels. Yes. But, uh, to help them in war on horses. It makes no, no sense. that was shocking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it kind of, well, imagine yourself riding on a horse. You yes. have those, what do you call them, stirrups. So yeah. if you're wearing so flats. So stilettos <laughs> will help you for some reason. <laughs> so if you're wearing flat shoes and you're standing up to shoot with your bow and arrow, you, you can easily slip. You needed mm. something to secure your feet into the stirrup. So what better way than to do it with a heeled shoe? I suppose yeah. so. So that eventually turned into, you know, like wearing higher and higher heels to look like as a fashion statement. But back then it had mm -hmm. a practical mm -hmm. use. Sometimes when I'm using one of those uh, uh, cycle machines at the gym, <laughs> I throw on some <laughs> <laughs> some strappy heels to keep me secure. I don't understand how it makes it, but I, I'm clearly missing it. I'm well, clear. you know, there's no, there's, I don't. I'm I don't understand why it's it's more <laughs> secure. But I'm sure uh, th there's a certain way in the stirrup. Yeah, yeah so yeah. it holds into the the stirrups. You know All those right. those I'm things that you show me later. So you, <laughs> I'm trying to like <laughs> use my hands do to describe you, do it. Do you know how heels in Farsi is young? Uh, oh. Posh Posh Boland. Oh, oh, yeah. wow. Boland. What is, what is it? Where does it come from? Boland is high. high posh is heel. It's heel. Yeah. All right. Well, so sorry. Little, <laughs> well that's where it comes from. It's the translation, sandwich. right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Keon, fascinating. You've done it again. You've uh, left us agog, agape, odd, wondering uh, about our own history and. Feeling such pride. You guys look very ashamed. What no, you I think it's great. You. I loved it. I this is one of my favorite seg wow. like segments of yeah. And it are made you, sense. The only thing somehow. I don't like about it is it's now considered uh, something that is uh, you know uh, inappropriate. Mean, well, not inappropriate. Well, no, there's that, but also that it's considered something that's uncomfortable mm -hmm. that women have to wear that has been imposed on them by um, ostensibly by fashion and everything. Now it turns out Persian men are the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the people who did this. So you guys can actually bring this back into fashion. I mean, what's who's to say you can't wear high heels? Well, you know, the Shah of Iran, I don't know if you remember back to uh, our interviews with um, when we did that little series on the Shah and we had Abbas Milani and, and um, Muhammad Amini yes, yes. Uh, and, and Andrew Scott Cooper and in Andrew Scott Cooper's book he details uh, how the, the the last Shah of Iran that is you know uh, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi uh, was actually kind of diminutive mm. like he's like 5'8 or 5'9 he's a, you know not a very tall man mm -hmm. and that he would and he was quite self-conscious about this and would always wear lifts like not exactly high heels yeah, in, the, yeah. mm -hmm. in the way that we know them but certainly platforms to appear taller interesting yeah. I had no idea huh the more you know it was on the show <laughs> it's on the show it's like you guys know, are like that's wow point. that's so interesting we yeah. did it on well, the show I, that's a minor yeah, detail uh, you forgot, that I have yeah, forgotten yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thanks for the reminder. All right. It's all Persian to us with Kian Nadimi. Thank you. Uh, Kian, we'll see you in a, a little bit with uh, Chef Haas coming back, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Let's get to our feature guests. You know, we've often noted the playing of music, the making of music, the access to music completely changed in Iran in the first couple of decades after the revolution of 1979, especially when it came to popular or alternative genres, a thriving musical creativity that had marked the 1970s in places like Tehran was suddenly shut down and sent into the underground. So it's impressive enough that a guy who was born a couple of years after the revolution would have the instincts and musical sensibilities of a Western jazz or pop player. But it's even more impressive if his playing and talents are undeniably world class. Reza Tajbakhsh is one of the most prolific and well-known popular musicians working in Iran today. He is a composer and arranger and a multi-instrumentalist. And to watch him play the piano and some of his jazz combos is to watch a young master at work. But he's also performed on and arranged many of the most well-known pop songs and artists coming out of Iran in recent years. Now Reza is stepping in front of the microphone to increasingly be the vocalist on his own music and productions as well. Take a listen to this. There you go, a little taste of the new song Kavir by Reza Tajbakhsh. That's Reza on most of the instruments, including piano, bass, drums, and also on vocals. One of his first releases as a vocalist. He actually wrote that song when he was 17, but has only decided to record it this year. It was released recently. And right now, the in-demand multi-instrumentalist producer, composer, and musical gem, Reza Tajbakhsh, joins me from Tehran. Hello, sir. Hi, Jian. How are you? First of all, I want to thank you about this compliments you know, <laughs> for the <laughs> for the interview. Uh, thank you for the interview and the situation you gave me. We're glad to have such a friend like you, and I'm at your service, man. <laughs> I'm so I'm so happy to talk to you, Yanni. Yanni, you're really not that good, Kigoftam. You know, the, 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 all the things <laughs> I said are not really that true. I but know it, I know basically, it. we we wanted to make you sound good. No, you Thank are you. you're a master, and it is uh, it is, and you're young, and it's and it's such a a pleasure to to have you on the program, my brother. So here, Thank you, you. Let, let, Thank let me you. start with this. I mean, we we keep hearing stories about how hard the COVID nineteen time has been for musicians. Obviously, COVID has hit. Iran pretty hard as well. And obviously the inability to tour or perform live is a big issue, but I'm thinking for someone who has who does a lot of recording, who composes, arranges yeah. like you do, maybe it's not been so bad. How has your year been during the pandemic? You know, too much to talk about corona, you know. Uh, for many hours we can talk, especially in Iran, and that's a different story. Um, in Iran, it's uh, you know people act like uh, then they get used to it. You know they don't follow um, health protocols anymore, and they they act like the corona has has been gone. You know right. because of the because of that, uh, no, Iran has the most um, amount of killed by corona in, uh, statistics. And uh, but uh, you know from another side, I think corona has done. Kind of big favor, I'll let you know. You know, it, it was a gift. I think, um, at least in my career, uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, before the Corona, um, all the concerts halls were full. You know, people um, 
didn't know who to follow. You know, 70% of you know, new grown pop single generations, which are um, all uh, uneducated, uh, illiterated with ungraceful manners, bad voices, you know, and people were uh, like metamorphosis, you know, like a statue, no power of decision, who to follow. Uh, they went just to concerts to have fun. Fortunately, they are off now. You know, I love it. Uh, it's the point. Um, because uh, you mean because you mean Corona has closed down the shitty concerts? <laughs> shit, yes. I, I I don't want to say shitty, but it was really shitty because of a uh, silence of these dummies, really dummies. I, I have to tell. And uh, new new talents, I see new voices were heard because of this silence, um, uh, oh. which we couldn't listen. Yeah, which we couldn't listen to them during an ordinary time before Corona, and. Uh, because they didn't have connections and money to be heard. And, uh, no, I discover uh, really good sounds, good talented musicians in this uh, pandemic time, you know. That's fascinating. No, no, I haven't heard that point made yet. That's a really, really interesting point. And it's not just unique to Iran, that this time when yeah. we've been locked in our homes has been an opportunity to, to discover things that we wouldn't normally discover in our busy, in the busy world, et cetera. But with that said, yeah. has it hurt you this last year not not being able to perform or or tour i i mean like i say you're so busy uh, arranging uh, producing working uh, has has your business been keeping up or has it been difficult no and it's not difficult no um it, it is good for me and i made my music at home and and i'm satisfied with that and you know the i took it as a, as an experience you know i did all my music which i didn't do it till these years no it's giving you the space to it's an opportunity yeah, it was yeah. an opportunity for me to have at least 10 tunes till uh, these monsters uh, i uh, released them and it's out now and you can listen it was what i want to uh, release uh, in these years but it wasn't time for do this but by the way i i i know this is the first long interview you've done in English. There was some talk beforehand. You and I were talking about whether we're going to do this in, in English or whether you'll speak in Farsi. I'm honored that you're doing it in, in, in English. Your English is very well, good. It's very good, especially despite the fact that you've <laughs> never lived in the West. Um, there's a yeah. story around this that you learned English from your grandfather. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Long story. My, and my grandpa, um, he was uh, a real walking dictionary, I remember. And uh, he has his own dictionary printed by himself in 1950. His An English dictionary? dictionary? I have or? it in English, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I remember he always told me, uh, um, you know, it, it was a sentence, he told me, uh, one day, one grammar rule and one word. You now, before I start to talk um, Farsi, uh, I started to learn English. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I was amazing. Four, this when is I was in, this in Tehran, I assume? In, in Tehran, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. So, uh, is is your grandfather still around? And uh, no, his his passed away. <laughs> well, I'm sure he would be very proud of you to be doing. Uh, thank you, thank doing you, thank you very in English. much. Uh, th this song we heard off the top, Kavir. Um, I, I wanted to play that one. I mean, there's so much to play when it comes to to you. There's so I many so many different genres of music. I don't want anybody to get the yeah. idea that that's just the only thing you do. That, and we'll play some different songs throughout this interview. But that one I wanted to play because it's one of your first ever recordings that is a song you wrote and that you're singing on as well as playing the instruments. How does it feel for you to be the singer on a song? Yeah, you know, the, the, that song really reminds me of my youth. Uh, it was the first song I've ever wrote, and uh, I really liked the orchestration. And, uh, you know, just mentioned this, I was just 16 or 17. And at that time, I was uh, under influence of uh, Mr. Elton John uh, with that uh, um, film called uh, Lion King uh -huh. especially the song oh, right. actually that makes yeah. sense it sounds like yeah. it could be a song from <laughs> Lion like King that. <laughs> good job that's, that's can you feel the love tonight <laughs> <laughs> if you have heard it absolutely uh, it was a very nice experience for me and and I had a good feedbacks from that you know people say um, it's the best you did and I think it is why had you not recorded it before um uh, 
you know, because of the time and, you know, my friend had uh, wanted to uh, sing on it and uh, time ago and uh, he sang. And I think um, when someone uh, make a music uh, with his feeling, with his emotions, uh, he is the best uh, to sing on it. I think uh -huh. uh, even he's not a singer. You right, know? right. You yeah, can, you think, can represent uh, your own music best, best in some yeah, ways. Yeah, I think. I regret it for my friend, but uh, until I d understood that I can sing it myself better th than the others, I did it. Reza, do you feel vulnerable as a singer since it, that's not what you're known for? It's not known as your forte? I can only imagine you're immensely confident when you're, when you, as an instrumentalist in any situation. Was it scary coming out as a vocalist? Oh, uh, let me tell you something. And um, I think um, music uh, responsibility is to um, purify your um, soul, your mind, and your spirit. And uh, I think it's a gift from God. And you are just a medium. I think we are just a medium. It's something inside uh, you, but it, it doesn't belong to you. you I mean, uh, um, you have to grant it to people. And if you don't, I think God won't forgive you. Um, and uh, no, I think there are different ways to grant it. Different mm -hmm. ways you consider you, you can play, you, you can um, sing. You, you can, can grant everything. it without being the vocalist. You, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Why I have to scare, you know, and if it is accept acceptable or not, no, I, I did my job. No worry about it. No, you no worry. I, now, are you being serious? Were you? Did, did you? Because I again, you're a, you're a master player. But I mean, you there was no part of you that thought, "Geez, if I do this, and what if somebody thinks I'm not a very good singer, or I'm not as good as Ali Reza Qurbani, or, or whatever?" You know, yeah, like yeah. A, I, uh, I never worry about this. Uh, I'm a musician, and I uh, do what uh, I think is right. You know as a musician i uh, know myself as a musician not a singer and i always tell people this um but it is okay for me not to be acceptable by everyone you know but i do my best I good think. for you man that's a great, it, it's, great it's it's the uh, point I'm proud it's of you point, without yeah. that perspective not enough of us have that kind of perspective you're you are someone who's hard to pin down, um, as I said, musically, because it's, it's for, for example, that song is clearly uh -huh. a pop song. I mean, you, you talked about The Lion King and Elton John. That's the pop realm. You arrange a lot of pop and rock kinds of music, but I also know that your passion is also jazz. And, and I want to yeah. play a taste of a song of yours that is actually one of my favorites. Um, this is from uh, a few years ago, 2017. It's called Vietnam Rain. Before we play yeah. a taste of it, what, what can you tell us about this piece? Uh, Vietnam Rain. Um, I wrote it for uh, a mezzo channel. Let me be clear. <laughs> um, we had a program to make a video for that and uh, send it to mezzo channel. Um, but uh, when you live in Iran, just unorganized things always comes and you can't do anything about it. Um, I just, and after that, I decided to publish the song individually on Spotify. Uh, and I did the old work. I played the drums and the bass live, and the piano also. Wait a minute. And wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, wait, yeah. wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait, wait. What? I, I, this is the first time. So this song, I think I thought it was like a jazz trio, and you're playing live with the, these other cats. So you're playing all the instruments on this? All, all the instruments, yes. Oh live. my god. The instruments. The I really instruments didn't like. know that. This is really impressive. Actually, you know why? Because I was going to ask you who the drummer is on this track. Yeah, because I the drumming is great on this track. I mean, you're you're the piano guy, but you're 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 a badass drummer too. I am a kind of multi instruments guy. Mm, not bad in drums and bass, but 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 the, the main is piano. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is okay. Let me let me uh, play this for people. So this is uh, a piece from uh, 2017 okay. called Vietnam Rain. Take a listen to this.
little taste of Reza Taj Bash and the song Vietnam Rain, uh, a song that apparently he's playing everything on. <laughs> That's you playing with yourself. <laughs> so so it, where, do you have a studio where you just have all these instruments set up and then you record one instrument at a time with something like that? Yeah, yeah. We have a very uh, good studio and uh, in uh, Tehran with my friend, with my partner. Uh, around 10 years, we have this uh, studio and uh, it's a well equipped studio it is and um i recorded them all in that studio with piano set c7 yamaha c7 uh john patty to bus uh mm-hmm. signature and tama drums I, oh, you have a Tama kit. I like the way you say bass. You say boss, which is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean bass, but a, but actually, basses should be called boss. You know, they're real boss and yeah. the, the way they play. Uh, <laughs> bass player, <laughs> your bass player, the bass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, speaking of this jazz realm, I know your your idol is Chick Corea, the the amazing uh, uh, jazz player. I mean, he's. He's known for his freeform style, his improvisational skills. I, I once told you about how um, I interviewed him once, and he did this amazing 20-minute improvisation. There's a lot of that in jazz, and, and it almost sounds like you were improvising even when you were recording Vietnam Rain there. You're doing a little uh, piano soloing. And yeah, stuff. yeah. When you're working in the pop genre as, as someone who comes from that jazz pedigree, that jazz field, do you feel restricted playing or arranging very structured pop songs that cannot be mm. as adventurous? You know, I never uh, restrict myself uh, because uh, Chikori is always my master. And, you no, know, I like to work any genres which is connected with jazz. I always want to put jazz chords in pop music. Uh, and, you no, know, I like to increase the level of pop music by this kind of work. And uh, as I know, I always did it. And because of this, it's the difference, uh, the difference of my arrangements with others. Uh, because of this course, which I learned from uh, my masters, like uh, Azza Mustafa Zadeh, Chikoria, and other pianists, and I really like to increase the level of arrangement uh, in Iran, music arrangement in Iran. Um, I use the chords uh, which I hear in Chikoria's arrangements, and. Uh, other jazz musicians, which I like it, which I like it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's the difference of me uh, in uh, ar- arranging uh, in you know, Iranian pop musics. By the way, is it true that you recently did a, a recording with, with a couple of guys from, uh, from Chick Corea's band, the guys who play with Chick? Well, it, it has a very long story. But the thing is, one of my friends, one of the greatest friends uh, who lives in Australia, he's a, a music teacher, Mehrat Sharif Bakhtiar. Uh, he's a pianist. And uh, he went on and uh, wanted to uh, give me a, a birthday gift. Uh, he uh, told me, uh, send, uh, send uh, one of my music to him. And I, I uh, send one of my music to him. And... Uh, uh, one of us, one of his friends was a drummer and told him to uh, play on this. And uh, he told uh, Mehra that I have a friend and I uh, offer him to play on it. And Mehra said, who is your friend? Uh, you play on it, please. And he said, uh, one of my friends called Dave Beckel <laughs> is it. <laughs> and right, right. Uh, that night, Me- Mehra and me uh, didn't sleep till... Uh, two days. I think. <laughs> Let me just explain to the audience. Dave Weckl is yeah. one of the great greatest drummers in the world. Certainly in the in the jazz genre, he's he's known for his incredible chops and everything. So uh, that that obviously would uh, lead to some sleepless nights of excitement. Yes, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, he's a great man uh, in manner and in uh, in the work. Everything was uh, good. He uh, played on it. Uh, he was in a tour, but he did it for me. And uh, everything uh, went very, very mm, good. And uh, uh, after that, he uh, offered Mr. John Patitucci for the bass. Wow. And we- uh, The boss, the boss, you mean. Yeah, yeah, for the (laughs) bass. We emailed him (laughs) and uh, he did it too. And uh, I'm always, it's an honor for me and for Iranian musicians to work with such a great musicians like this, I think. (sighs) That's a dream come true, man. Good for you. It, it was it was my dream because I always 
listen to uh, the tunes he played in uh, from my childhood, uh, from 90s. And I always I thought that he is the best. He is the, the best drummer I have ever known as him. So, so just to be clear, you, you, you didn't tell Patatucci and Weckl, actually, guys, I can play the bass and drums. I don't need you. Uh, no, <laughs> I didn't tell them. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't tell them. Uh, but it was a, a very, very nice experience for me. I can imagine. And the, the, the thing is, uh, he, after he played, uh, he uh, just get, got involved in mixing and mastering Mr. Weckl because it was important for him to play in... Uh, uh, my song or you know any anybody's song it, it, i mean it's very uh, good and it's uh Chimian, Herfei, Heli, um invested in the song yeah they really yeah, care yeah. he cares it's it's amazing it's amazing he he, cares. He, he cares he's a legend he he's does. a legend yeah, yeah, well, yeah. He's a Reza, legend. T- tell me how uh, take us back to how this all started for you i mean you were you're born after the revolution, as I mentioned in the introduction, and it's so interesting for me as as an Iranian kid who grew up in the West to even imagine yeah. how you could find the styles of music you've come to not just play, but to to have these world class chops playing. When did you first know you loved music, and where did you find it? Uh, it was um, I think around 1990 or 1991 when I was uh, 11 that I had my first piano built by my grandpa. <laughs> I started with classics, you know, it was hard. And for over seven year or eight years, I played classics. But um, from a time... By which you mean class- uh, classical music? Classical music, yes. 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 And uh, from a time I just thought with myself, what about creativity, you know? Not that the best thing you can do on classic pieces is the nuance, nuance, I mean, it comes up and down the music, you know, yes, what's nuance. Yes, nuance, yeah. I mean, it, you can't change uh, anything. You can change the subject. You can't create, you know. But in jazz, it's not like that. You're always, always creating. You're improvising and do what you like. Yes. I, I do such a thing. I love, I love this kind of music, you know. And uh, because of that, I didn't do uh, the classics anymore and when I heard someone called Mr. Jigoria I thought that music is this but honestly in the early 90s I mean certainly not in the 80s but even the early 90s where would you even hear jazz in Iran? I just covered let me tell you something Um, one of my friends introduced Aziza Mustafa Zadeh as a pianist, Azari's pianist very nice piano player Uh um, who has her traditional music and mix her traditional music with jazz and combine them. And uh, I cover it. Uh, and you know, covering is the most crucial thing in music, I think. Until you get to your signature, until you um, uh, have your signature. Find your sound, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I covered, I covered from Haide, really, to uh, mm-hmm. uh, Chikoria. Wow. I covered, I covered everything I heard. Now, my, my question about where to get it was, I don't want to be uh, patronizing in the sense that I know that there was uh, all kinds of music that has gotten into Iran and, and people would find ways to, to get it through CDs and suitcases and, and buying it in underground places or whatever. But uh, that explains a lot of the pop or rock or you know popular music. But jazz, I mean, something like Chick Corea, I'm just actually very curious who actually introduced you to Chick Corea? I mean, because e- even in the West, it, you know, it's uh, you have to be a certain type of person who finds that kind of music, let alone sitting in Tehran in the 1990s. Uh, I don't remember how it started, but uh, but it was hard because um, there was no uh, CD, uh, and uh, it was hard to uh, gain these um, CDs and musics here. Yeah. Uh, it was some some were like. Um, what you call it, um, Khane Kitab or something like, was, uh, was there something like that? that a library? Uh, me, he, a kind of library it right. was. But it, it was hard to gain at You know, all. Uh, it occurs to me that it's also hard being an Iranian kid um, uh, in a, you know, a decently well-off family that your your parents, normally the parents would, would, 
would suggest that you don't gravitate towards music or that you play more classical stuff. Your parents are both artists. Your mom is a yeah. ballet dancer. Your dad is a painter. So um, maybe I'm thinking they were more open to their son becoming a musician than some parents would be. Did they encourage your playing? I was a little fortunate, you know, born in an art lover family, uh, which is which is really not an advantage, but it's good. Uh, my father was a painter. My mother was a ballet dancer, and you know, the genetics uh, did his work. You know, mm. uh, I want to mention a story about my neighbor. Our neighbor, Mr. Garami, um, was the person who took rock and roll dance to Iran in early 60s. Oh. And it was a point for me. I always remember him. He, he has passed away now. But um, I want to tell you, there were a lot of things together that um, encouraged me to yeah, continue music. You grew music. up in a great yeah. environment, it sounds like. A really yeah. a f- a creatively fertile environment. So, which is, which is all the more interesting because you're this amazing, amazing musician. You're in that environment. But then you end up going to university for microbiology. Uh, so, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. why, why did you end up studying microbiology? Uh, you know, I have to confess, uh, and I, I never liked that. No, I never liked that. <laughs> but uh, no, it was full of experiences and connections for me. I found friends which I never found music till now. I don't have much uh, friends, but uh, some of them uh, are from that time, uh, from university. I just look at it as an experience. But let me tell you, I, I was a very good student with, with high grade numbers, you know. And, but but I didn't like it. Uh-huh. You know? I didn't like it. So did you finish <laughs> your degree? Yeah. <laughs> you did? You're a microbiologist. Yeah. But uh, not in four years. In th- uh, six or seven years, it's finished. <laughs> With some yeah. piano playing uh, at the yeah. same time. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, I wonder how much you thought this reality could happen for you. I, as a teen, going back, you know, uh, 20 years into the Iran of the, the late 1990s, say. Did you think, Reza, a, a music career in Iran, especially if you're not going to play, be playing classical music, mm. you're not going to be Shajarian, did yeah. you think it would be possible to to have a, a, a good music career? No, really not. No. And as you know, carrying instruments uh, were illegal. What about playing and having concerts, you know, as a carrier, no, um, but it happened. Uh, no, um, it was my chance, or better to say, my generation chance. Um, at that time, while Hatemi came in, it was like uh, it's going to be a little open. Some everything is going open in politics, in arts, in cultures, in a- a- anything. And it was a chance, I think. And um, I mean, I-, I didn't want to have it as a carrier, but it happened to me. You become this this great musician, but also um, a prolific and in demand arranger and producer. When did you realize you had a gift for taking other people's songs, working with other musicians, and arranging and producing them? Uh, I think I, I was in the right place from the first working years. I was eighteen or seventeen when I had my f- eighteen, yeah, when I had my first performance and. Uh, the f- first production is going back to those years uh, with my friends um, Sara Naini, Hamid Hami, Hamid Khandan, uh, but great friends. I don't know how it really happened. I just thought uh, I can do it. Um, you never know how it happens, you know. You never, you never know how it comes. I just let it go, you know. Well, you're you're the go-to guy. I mean, uh, the musicians I know who know the the scene in Iran basically tell me that you're the guy. You know that if you want to go to the top arranger or you know the person to play on your your albums, a lot of people come to you. You mentioned Sara yeah. Nayani. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to actually play a taste of, of, of quite quite a well known song. Uh, I, I'm not sure how yeah. you say it. Esharat Nazar is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah. Esharat yeah. Nazar. Uh, this is a song that you did the arrangement of. Um, tell us a bit about this song, and then we'll play a little bit of it. Um, in those years, it's, it's around two, uh, 2009. Yeah, uh, Milad uh, was uh, Milad came to me. 
yeah, he's a very nice tar, tar player. I think the best in Iran. Uh, he came to me and uh, just sang this song, and I thought that who can sing it better than, than uh, others? And it was always my choice, Sara. She is the perfect song. She has a perfect uh, voice, and we went to a studio with uh, Mr. Hojat, Omid Hojat, and Iman Hojat, uh, who are the best and well-known guitarist and mix man in Iran. And uh, we just recorded it. And, uh, you know, it was a very, very nice feedback for us. Reaction, yeah. We released yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, when, did, when did it come out, exactly? 2009, I, th- I think. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Let me yeah. let me play a little bit of this. This is Esharat uh, Nazar, uh, featuring music by Milad Derakhshani, lyrics by Husheng Ebtahaj, and the vocals by Sara Nayani. This is the arrangement by Reza Tajbash. Take a listen to this. <laughs> Reza, when you're arranging a song or working on it or recording it, can you tell, do you, do you have a sense of what's going to be a hit and what's not? We um, can't talk about it. No, no. Uh, it has its own elements that uh, n- n- no one can uh, talk about it. Predict. That's what oh, will okay. happen when we oh. release the song. Yeah. Uh, we have to do our best uh, and see what will happen. No, no, we can't tell about what will be the mega hit or uh, what won't be the mega hit. But you, we can't, we can't. you must have a sense. I think, I think you probably at this point, when you're working on certain songs, know that this one is one that the audience is really going to react to, and this one not so much. I mean, you you probably have those instincts. I appreciate what you're saying that you can't you can't predict. But um, I mean, that song to me, listening back, it, it, it seems obvious to me that people would love that one. Um, in that time, we can't predict this. Uh, no. Uh, good music. Uh, it has a nice arrangement and uh, simple and, you know, people liked it and I appreciate it. Okay. So I have to ask you this question about being in Iran and staying in Iran. You're sitting in Tehran right now. Um, Reza, there are many extremely talented musicians who end up leaving Iran, um, sometimes they, because they say they, they, they don't feel like they had a choice because in the uh-huh. pop or jazz or alternative genres, uh, they want to be they want to play in a bigger pond they want to have a bigger audience and they want to work in a major industry in the west uh, as i've uh-huh. said a, a few times in this interview you're you're one of the best there is tell me about your decision to stay in iran so far um even when you're excited about working with musicians who aren't in iran like Weckel, etc et no i always prefer to stay you know at the age of 40 um you know, it's a little bit hard to leave and uh no, I have my own plans. Uh, if I want to work with uh, abroad, I do it. Uh, no, after Corona, and you know, and the thing is, uh, I am in the playground yet. I think I am in the playground yet. Uh, I can work here. I can do uh, my music. I can uh, release my music, and um, I have more to do here. I think till I have to go. I, I go to, uh, abroad. You know. Mm. I think I can still mm, work here because I have my playground and uh, people uh, love me to mm, play for mm, them in Iran. You know, I have to say, in a way, I love hearing that because we hear so much of the opposite. Um, you know, folks, I mean, I, I pick any kind of musicians we've had on the program from Hamid, yeah, Hamid Dikpe to Ali Azimi yeah. or, you know, all these guys who say, or, or, or I'm women as well, who say, you know, we, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't stay and do what I wanted to do there. Um, has there ever been a time where you were tempted, where you thought, you know, I've got to pick up and go to London or New York or Los Angeles? Mm. Uh, not for now. Maybe I go and come back, but n- n- 
I, I don't go for forever and to be there and work, you know. Tell me what it's like in, in Tehran these days. I want to ask you about how you describe the music scene there. It's obviously uh-huh. more open and alive than it would have been in the 80s or 90s when it was extremely repressed by the government. But you've said it's free now. Uh, it's azad yeah. again, but there's no Ozard, taste. Uh, <laughs> when when it yeah, was not yeah. free, at least there was taste. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. as I said, at that time... Uh, we can't play, but taste is very better. Now it's not like that. Now, as I said, now we need. A, I think we need a big change in tastes, um, visual tastes, oral tastes, everything. You know, every tastes are coming under the lines. Really, you can feel it in any art, not just music. I, I, I talk about the culture. I talk about everything. The, the the tastes are coming really under the lines and um what, what do you mean by that can you describe what you mean by um by the, the it's that that there isn't isn't taste right now uh, how how is it not satisfying for you with the the art or the music that's being created in tehran um no i mean the real art the real art mm, is not very very um, followed by everyone you know right right uh, the, the thing the thing we can do is at least follow follow real art and and show it to the people. No, it may doesn't change anything in short range of time, but no, it will appear in uh, long term. You know, it will appear in long term. And um, I think um, we, we are the people who uh, ha- ha- that ha- has to follow the uh, real art that people may um, do it um, and follow follow us. Yeah. The, the, the stuff you don't like, the, it it just feels very manufactured. Like they're just doing what it what they have to to get a lot of clicks or get a lot of uh, uh, and, and and it's kind of bullshit lyrics and 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 the same old melodies. I mean, what can you describe what it is that's not not getting you excited about what's being uh, being at the top of the? Uh, I guess what's what's garnering the biggest audience right now. I mean, all the musics we um, listen to in Iran. Uh, all similar to each other it's going to be similar to each other right and no no good arrangements and uh, no good voices and uh, so no melodies no bad words bad lyrics so what about the music what happens to the music right you know we haven't got these elements and so we, we, we need a big change how do you change that yeah, I can change that, but I know uh, time will, I think. You are so omnipresent in so much of contemporary Iranian music on uh, the good stuff, I should say. And you, you have you've now launched songs where you're also singing. Tell tell me where Reza Tajbash is on his journey. Where would you ideally like to take your career next? Uh, no, uh, I think music has no end. No, art never ends. As I know myself uh, emotionally, and I can tell you what happens to me uh, tomorrow, or you no. Know, uh, so I don't decide about it. Um, I just I just let it go. You know, tomorrow may uh, you see me uh, just conducting uh, conducting symphonic orchestra. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe uh, everything it will be happen. I don't know. I just let it go. Um, I just let it go and I don't decide about it. Well, it sounds like uh, part of what's happening is that the dreams that you've had, you've already, uh, you're achieving. You're you're putting out an album with uh, uh, with, uh, with with a no, bass player and drummer who are your- he, I go step by step to goes, my, my dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no hurry. Um, I think I will achieve it. <laughs> I'm so happy that we got a chance to do this. I'm so happy to do it in English and to try and introduce you to uh, uh, a whole new audience. You are such a, um, a talented guy. Uh, and you did something really special this year that I want to go out on. It's a song that, uh, I, I mean, huh? special for me because I'm, I'm a big fan of this What's band that? you worked with. This is a, you did this duet with the lead singer and songwriter of a British band uh, called Star Sailor. 
Uh-huh. Um, this is from <laughs> earlier this year. I was so surprised, actually. This ended up in my uh, social media inbox. This is, like, I, I don't know, six or eight months ago. And I was like, what is this? What's going on? This is James Walsh from Star Sailor singing, and then you're there singing in Farsi. Uh, it was quite amazing. How did this this come together? Yeah, um, I was not a fan, really. Not I was not a fan of... Uh, Star Sailor and Mr. James Wall. But uh, <laughs> does he I, know I, that? I like I liked them. I, I, no, I, I want uh, just because fan uh, it's his own um, uh, meaning. Okay, I, 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 I wasn't the fan because of the music. You uh-huh. know. Uh, but I liked them. Uh, what one of the friends called Darius Salepur was always the fan. And uh, in pandemic, um, he said he told me that uh, if we can have this collaboration together. And uh, I just directed uh, Mr. Walsh and uh, told him what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do. And he said, okay. And uh, it went on and we uh, arranged the music, uh, rearranged the music and sent him. And he uh, just sang on it and sent, sent us back. And it was a very, very nice experience for us. And thank you, Mr. Walsh, for collaboration. And I am the fan of him now. <laughs> it, it, it must have been so fascinating for him to hear yes. one of his songs sung in Farsi with with these. And musicians. after that, after that, after the uh, song, uh, if you go to my Instagram and see, he uh, talks in Farsi, a sentence in Farsi. Yes, I see. And that. It was very nice for us. Are you, are you still in touch with him? Are you guys going to work on anything? or yeah, More or less, not uh, uh, now. <laughs> you should invite him to Iran. Maybe he should come and see Iran. Yeah, maybe. It's, why not? Uh, but after Corona, we can do it, yeah. Yes. Um, Reza, I, I am uh, very grateful for the time you've given too. us. And I really... Uh, appreciate uh, what you do and uh, I hope that in the post corona world that uh, uh, we'll see each other in person I hope you can do a tour coming to the west and and or if not just visit us here and and or vice versa so we can we can see each other play music together and and we can have you uh, and applaud you here in Canada and the United States as well yeah I'm I'm so grateful too uh, I want to see you and uh, at last really uh, again excuse me for my english you you tell me not to uh, say this but i tell you excuse me for my english and uh, thank you for the interview and your time and everything it was nice listen I'm, 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 I'm grateful to you but i'm even more grateful i'm even more grateful to your grandfather who, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> who who had the dictionary? He taught you. He, he brought the music to you. I mean, your grandfather was responsible for everything. This guy was amazing. He, you know, was amazing. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah, really, he was was. really amazing. Merci, Thank Azam. you very much. Uh, talk talk to you soon. Good Reza Taj Bash, one of the most prolific and well-known popular musicians working in Iran today. He is a composer and arranger a multi-instrumentalist, Reza Taj Bakhsh, join me from Tehran today. دار دنیا همش بوده یه رویا ساده بودیم ما on you still but they don't 
There you go. I love that so much because I'm a Star Sailor fan. That's a little taste of Reza Taj Bakhsh performing with James Walsh of Star Sailor doing the great Star Sailor song, Way to Fall. Uh, I really uh, appreciate Reza coming on the show. I really enjoyed that interview. I, I am quite astounded by some of his opinions that were um, bold and very interesting. Like the idea that COVID is a great thing because um, it's allowed us to get past some of the the shittier artists and <laughs> discover love, some good yeah. stuff. I think that's such a refreshing yes, and interesting and, and a positive way to look at this uh, this pandemic. Ashaya? Yes, actually, it was shocking to me too. And uh, I was surprised about his spiritual mind, you know? Like he said that we are a channel and I really surprised. I love that kind of view to huh, the music. Yeah, yeah. And he's so... Um, I mean, he's not super young and he's got a lot of experience and he's very busy and he's well known, but he's so excited the way he was talking about Chick Corea and, oh, yeah. and, and the players he's playing with. He's like a, yeah. he's like a kid, you know, who's uh, just been invited into yeah. the room and, and yet he's got this great career. I mean, I, I love to hear that type of visceral passion from a, a musician. He, he looks like Chick Corea at some way in his hair. Kind of, hair. yeah, yeah, yeah. Earlier, yeah, earlier in yeah. his life, Chick Corea. Uh, Captain Reza? Uh, he was very excited because I think he's never ha- done an interview like this before. Uh, you're a musician yourself. You've, you've, you've done music in the past. And uh, I think he was very excited because you were asking all the right questions and going down a path that he was very passionate about. But one thing that I wish he would have elaborated on a little bit more was the very point that you just mentioned, how COVID filtered out uh, crappy musicians, (laughs) essentially. I don't know if it has really, because, I mean, it's affected every musician in a certain, in in the same way. Well, one thing he's saying is is, is it it prevents people from going to, uh, going out to see shows of people, a very sort of pop centric stuff that uh, manufactured stuff that they would normally be going out to see and so I guess uh, de- de- deterred from doing that they can assess other options maybe was the the implication I guess so but it prevents people from just going out and see good music as well and then when COVID is over I guess all th- everything is going to be back to normal so I wish you would have elaborated on that a little I think more. I get his point I think in Iran a lot of these artists have backup like ha- they have somebody financially putting them mm. up there and unfortunately a lot of them are quote unquote garbage artists mm-hmm. as he eloquently said so and he has a point I mean like on Radio Javan for example and that's like the MTV of Persian community I swear every week there's some new like just complete trash that's released <laughs> and somehow I'm like who's supporting this it's like talent is a is a suggestion yeah. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to first of to all have please it. don't call Shia's music trash hey, yeah. no no <laughs> I love it's always Shia's on Radio music. Javon it, Shia's music is gold like, <laughs> like okay. Reza uh, you, you know I, I actually think you're, you're right Keon and I think that it's not dissimilar think of it this way Reza mm. think about um I feel like there's been this opportunity over the last year when it comes to, for example, television and you know Netflix. Yep. People are much more interested in going deep in Netflix to discover. There's a lot of talk about what people should be watching and and good series and what what's gratifying. What's a, you know people have more ch- chance, more opportunity, um, especially in those early months where there's just lack of anything to do when you're completely locked down to discover things that they wouldn't normally discover in their, you know, busy life and okay, this is what I do and I watch The Bachelor and I listen to a crappy pop song, you know. <laughs> but now you're home and it's like, well, what about this option? Mm. What about I, I, you know, maybe that's part of you have, maybe, maybe. you have more time to to put in the effort to look for something new. Like whereas in the past you would just look at whatever's mainstream. Like you don't you don't have time, so you just, you know, you put on the TV and whatever is on you watch, yeah. so. Yeah, I think that's the difference. And Reza, why do you hate Reza Taj Bash so much? <laughs> it's successful, and he looks very young. No, I'm joking. He can't, I can't Your believe. namesake, Reza. I know, I know. But he looks so young. I couldn't believe Like He posted something about turning 40. Wow. Did really? You, it, he looks 14. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, incredible. Lucky Good bastard. Yeah, he's <laughs> uh, those great musicians. But, but yeah. He's very he talented. He, he played, is he played super all talented. All those instruments yeah. himself? That he is, is super talented. That's impressive. You know who else is talented? <laughs> the captain of cuisine? Oh. Of course. 
He is the captain of cuisine. He's the culinary colonel, the Tabrizi talisman, the Farsi foodmeister, the Turkish tradesman. Ladies and gentlemen, Bacha, it's your chef, Hasare, and this is Rook Hospitality. Hi, this is your chef, Hasare, and this is Rook Hospitality. I love the little robot version of uh, Chef Haas that <laughs> repeats what he's saying when he says it. Hello, Chef Haas, are you there? Hi there. Hi, how are you? Greetings to you. How is beautiful San Francisco? It's Mizuni, Mizuni. Wonderful, nice sunny day, and couldn't be better. Mizuni? Mizuni, Mizuni. <laughs> uh, that, that word is stuck in my mind. Even I post something about it last night after running 50 miles. Mizuni, Mizuni for today. I am, I am thrilled at the idea of propagating the word Mizuni further into the, <laughs> the Persian diaspora. Um, what are you going to teach us about today? What, what are we focusing on on hospitality today? Uh, today we're going to talk about the secrets of the kitchen and techniques, more specifically about the herbs and vegetables, how to handle them and have enhance the flavors in our Persian Iranian cooking. So secrets of the kitchen and specifically herbs and vegetables and how to how to cook them. I, I'm, I'm enticed by the idea of secrets of the kitchen. So for those who don't know, um, why, I mean, like me, in fact, I, I, if I think about this question, why, why in general is using herbs and vegetables so uh, important to Iranian cuisine? There's lots of factors here. We're talking about herbs and vegetables. One is that geographically, if you look at Iran, luscious with the wild grown vegetables, herbs, fruits, and everywhere. And that helps on the, our culinary, regional culinary cuisine. And also, we look at as a diet and health benefits and nutritious values, how much affect on the, our food diet. And also, as a balancing fact, which is in the future, we're going to talk about it. I don't want to, I want to basically touch about Sardio Jeremy. There are some herbs and vegetables. They are Sardio Jeremy that balance hot and cold, balance the dishes we are, we are cooking in the, our cuisine. So there are lots of reason behind it. It's so interesting because over the years when people, when non-Iranians have asked me what Persian cuisine is like, uh, the extreme short form I use is to say, it's generally, I mean, other than kebabs and things like a chalo kebab, it's generally meat-based stews over over rice. I mean, that that would be the the very basic way to explain it to a non-Iranian. But actually, uh, herbs and vegetables are such a big part of it that 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 sells us short, doesn't it? Well, correct. But let's talk why is like a meat considered as a sardi, the cold. Then the vegetables, you add the herbs in it here, Jeremy. So it's basically you, and the rice is the sardi. So you want to balance the dishes. They were like experimental uh, from the uh, history, passed around generation. And there's a reason how they balance the dishes with the fresh herbs, dry herbs, or fruit in our dishes. So like in American way, we can call it uh, salt, fat, acid, and heat. These are the, some factors on our diet to our body needs to get that perfect nutritious value and in our daily diet base. Interesting. So it's about balancing those herbs and vegetables and the meats, um, which we don't get in chela kebab, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that's why they serve sabzi, like herbs, or on the tomatoes. side of kebab to right, balance that right, out. Is right. that why, Is chef? Is that why, Chef? Yes, exactly. And if you see, what, again, I'm going to be biased. Persian food is one of the best food, in my opinion, as a chef in the world, because we use, a, we care about the dishes we put together. It's not just for fuel for our body, it was a medicine factor mm. to our body needs. Like basically, while balance, we are balanced by combination of the fruits and vegetables, herb, whatever, it's regarded as a very good diet and capable of the strengthening our body and mind. So that's the basic fundamental of the Iranian cuisine, Persian cuisine. So my mom always says she's like Persian cuisine is the best you know it's, there's a science behind it it's well thought out she always says that so I guess yeah you doubled that up Chef Haas. so how to get to your um, segment here how, how can we make Iranian dishes more vibrant and enhance the, the, the herbs and vegetables I'm thinking of something like I think you were going to talk about Bagali Polo today right how, yes how, how do we do that in a way that you're talking about with the secrets of the kitchen when it comes to herbs and vegetables yeah Bagali Polo one sample of the what we're going to talk basically Bagali Polo is the fava beans dill rice 
and the basic technique of rice pilaf cooking and it uh, a dill and bagali goes inside the rice and steam for hour more than a little hour and then serve with the some kind of meats mostly is a lamb shank or sometime neck of the lamb what is your secret that you're teaching us today so basically uh as a chef technique, we take the this herb and uh, fava beans away and uh, treat it separately. Like for example, you take the fava beans, you blanch them. When you blanch beans, you have a hot boiling water with salt, and you cook it. And again, people you see it on the recipe say two minutes, five minutes. Those are doesn't work because every vegetable has its own different timing. So as long as you see this beautiful green color wiper and shows in the water, boiling water, you put the vegetable, you take it out and dump it in the ice water from the Ooh. further cooking. So that's called blanching and keeps the most beautiful color of the your vegetables, like your fava beans. Then you take that one, treat it with the, some caramelized onion and fresh dill and bean, and towards the end, you take the rice pilaf ready, you mix it together and serve it on the dish. So you have this beautiful crunchy vegetables and herbs and flavors there. And not only presentation, but also good flavor. Ah, mm. so do them separately. Yeah, I use that as an example. Like the same green thing goes to uh, uh, lubia polo, uh, the, the green beans. Same, when you cook after cook, you see the green beans are black. So if still flavor is there, don't let's respect the dish. It's gonna, but as a presentation, as a more crunchy, like we like vegetables crunchy because you wanna keep the nutritious value and in it rather than cooking it too much. So in this case, you are giving it different angle to dish as a presentation, as a flavor and balance in the dish. So oh, this is fascinating. So for the video that um, people are gonna be able to see at our, at our site, uh, is it you showing us how you make the bagali polo? Yes, I am showing the. Actually, I, I am describing more bagali polo, but also I took advantage of this video. I am somehow going through how to make the pilaf and also showing how to bloom the saffron the right way. Unfortunately, mm. most people in America they destroy the saffron, but since I use saffron in my bagali polo, I took advantage of this video and I'm showing the bloom in the saffron with a ice cubes wow, wow. awesome <laughs> okay so we'll we'll uh go to the to rookmedia.com to see uh chef's recipe and his secrets for how to make bagali polo and, and, and the ingredients therein thank you for this we'll talk to you next week brother always a pleasure thank you bye chef bye, Haas. bye. that's chef hasare in san francisco with hospitality see the video now at rook media.com rookmedia.com and telegram those are the two places you could see chef uh his recipes and his techniques and secrets for how he's making these things rookmedia.com or our telegram channel which is rook media this is full time for rook for today thank you to you guys for listening and thank you so much to the amazing team who put this show together each week Producer Susan, Ponta the Artist, Thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon, Chef Haas, Savvy Roham, Aray Merdad, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe. And as we talked about through this show, we now have our patrons page available. Become a patron, become our BFF, or whatever level of patronage feels comfortable. Thanks again, everybody. See you Monday. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. And as ever, as I just said to Chef Haas, well, Mizu Bashi. Bye.